Francis Bacon, his Rosicrucian brotherhood and literary mask, William Shakespeare. In his essay of Simulation and Dissimulation, the great poet-philosopher Francis Bacon sets out and provides a masterclass on the vital importance of secrecy, when it is needed and in what circumstances it is unavoidable, which extended to the secrecy that was required for the authorship and publication of the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. Francis Bacon lived in dangerous times. Poets, writers and dramatists risked imprisonment, torture and even death, making secrecy a necessity that compelled him to conceal his identity behind his literary mask, William Shakespeare of Stratford. An even stricter level of secrecy was needed for the production of the Shakespeare First Folio, a Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic illusion that still beguiles and misdirects the world to the present day. In 1605, Bacon issued his first major philosophical work entitled The Advancement of Learning. He dedicated it to King James, whom not by accident he compared with the wisest of all monarchs, King Solomon. The wise King Solomon was the inspiration behind the great college called Solomon's House in his utopian fable New Atlantis, or Land of the Rosicrucians, organised and directed by divine Rosicrucian philosopher-scientists who pursued all arts and sciences for the raising of man's estate and the betterment of humanity in perpetuity, with Solomon's temple forming the key central myth of its outer body, the Freemasonry Brotherhood. It was in the advancement of learning Bacon first set down detailed comments regarding poetry and drama, which largely remain unknown. In Book 2, he divides learning and understanding into three parts. The parts of human learning have reference to the three parts of man's understanding, which is the seat of learning. History to his memory, poesy to his imagination and ph philosophy to his reason. Bacon defined the word poesy to mean fictional and poetical writing in either prose or verse, the very kind that was masterfully given full vent across the unrivalled canvas of his Shakespeare poems and plays. The use of this feigned history hath been to give some shadow of satisfaction to the mind of man because the acts or events of true history have not that magnitude which satisfieth the mind of man, posy feigneth acts and events greater and more heroical. Poetical narrative is a mere imitation of history, with the excesses before remembered, choosing for subject commonly wars and love, rarely state and sometimes pleasure or mirth. Much of the above is repeated in the corresponding passage in Book 2 of the De Augmentis, published within days of the Shakespeare First Folio, followed by the passage cited below on dramatic poesy, not found in the advancement. Dramatic poesy, which has the theatre for its world, would be of excellent use if well directed. And certainly it is most true, and one of the great secrets of nature, that the minds of men are more open to impressions and and affections when many are gathered together than when they are alone. One of the ways Bacon was intent on furthering the advancement of learning was through his Shakespearean dramas, which he prophetically realised would, in the fullness of time, to use his own metaphor, be performed throughout the theatre of the world in states not then born and languages still unknown. This would partly be achieved through the secret invisible engines of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, whose own rituals and degrees are themselves built upon the same dramatic principles as the Shakespeare plays, coloured with Baconian ideas and language. His Rosicrucian Freemasonic advancement of learning draws attention to the many chronic deficiencies of numerous areas of learning, whole regions where more might be known if men would only apply their minds to the renewal of all arts and sciences, the defects of which Bacon had so devastatingly anatomised. 
Such industry would result in an increased knowledge and understanding of nature for the betterment of humankind. Learning, such as it was, consisted for the most part in the stagnant institutions of the universities. In a striking passage, Bacon refers to a fraternity or brotherhood in learning, through which knowledge and intelligence could be freely circulated and exchanged. The universities, with their vested interest, did not promote this kind of reciprocation, and there was insufficient mutual intelligence between the learned institutions of Europe. The sterile universities were content to stagnate in the barren wastelands of Aristotelian philosophy, but the time had now arrived for a brotherhood of learning, based upon brotherly love to transcend national boundaries, taking the kingdom of man forward into a new world and future of learning. One is immediately struck, as was Dr Yates, by the language deliberately employed by Bacon and for good reason. He thinks of learning as illumination, a light descending from the Father of Lights and the Brotherhood in learning as a fraternity in learning and illumination. The kind of themes and imagery these very deliberately chosen phrases invoke find an echo and amplification in the first Rosicrucian manifesto, the Fama. The correlation is not lost on Dr. Yates. Nine years later, the historian observes, in Germany, the Rosicrucian family was to portray the R.C. brothers as a fraternity of Illuminati, as a band of learned men joined together in brotherly love. In fact, the so-called Baconian and Rosicrucian movements are one and the same. In the advancement, Bacon uses one method of delivery and in the Rosicrucian manifestos another in accordance with the, audience, the audiences he is seeking to attract. The one exoteric and the other esoteric. The first with his name to it and in the case of the Rosicrucian manifestos in these dangerous times concealed behind secrecy and anonymity. When we return to the corresponding passage in the much revised and enlarged De Augmentis, published within days of the Shakespeare first folio, the hints and allusions found in the 1605 passage begin to emerge more clearly. It will be observed that apart from minor differences in language or modes of expression, there are several interpolations not found in the 1605 edition. Thus, it is clear that in the passage of illumination and lights, Bacon is alluding to his secret invisible Rosicrucian Brotherhood, which exists in several sovereignties and territories throughout Europe. A noble and generous order of learned and illuminated spirits and minds, who are in contact and correspondence with each other, all drawn and bound together by a love of shared ideals and aspirations. All this in a work in its original form, first published in 1605, a full five years before the Fama was known to be circulating in manuscript, and a nine years before the Rosicrucian Manifesto was first printed in 1614. It appears that the contents of the Fama, prior to its known circulation in manuscript and its subsequent publication, was familiar to Ben Jonson, editor and contributor to the Shakespeare First Folio. With the accession of King James I, Jonson began to compose court masks, often in collaboration with Inigo Jones. Following the ascending of King James to the English throne, Inigo Jones was elected Grand Master of England with William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, to whom Bacon jointly dedicated the Shakespeare First Folio, appointed his Grand Warden. As is well known, several of Johnson's later plays, with a certain degree of irony and humour, allude or explicitly refer to the Rosicrucian Brothers or the Rosicrucian Movement. Yet, until recently, an allusion in The Alchemist had, for nearly 400 years, remained unnoticed. In the Fama, we find the following famous passage, where it is stated, In England, he is much spoken of, and chiefly because he cured a young Earl of Norfolk of the leprosy. On turning to The Alchemist, we meet with an allusion to this famous passage. 
In Johnson's play, Ananias and Tribulation, Holy Brethren of Amsterdam visit Subtle in search of alchemical gold. Through the alchemical gold's medicinal qualities, Subtle tells them that they will be able to further their cause. You restore with the oil of talc, there you have made a friend and all, all her friends, a lord that is a leper. Johnson's collaboration with Grandmaster of England Inigo Jones in writing and producing several Baconian Rosicrucian masks in the first decade of the 17th century and his allusion to the original or manuscript copy of the Rosicrucian Manifesto the Fama in The Alchemist all attest to his involvement with Bacon's Rosicrucian Freemasonic Brotherhood and, as we shall see, Johnson also knew that Bacon was the secret author of the Shakespeare works. Around the same time, Ben Jonson was writing and completing The Alchemist, with its clear allusion to the Rosicrucian Manifesto the Fama. Bacon was himself busy writing his Rosicrucian Shakespeare play Cymbeline. The first reference to the play was noted by the astrologer Simon Foreman, who witnessed a performance of the play in the spring of 1611. It is generally agreed by Shakespeare scholars that Cymbeline was written during 1610 or in the early part of 1611. It was first printed in the Rosicrucian Freemasonic Shakespeare First Folio, where this special Shakespeare drama was very deliberately printed as its final play. The play is closely connected with the old town of Verulam, close to the site of the Bacon's country estate Gorhambury, and from whence Bacon took his title Baron Verulam. The site of Old Verulam, where Bacon grew up, close to the Bacon family estate at Gorhambury St Albans, the proto-martyr St Alban is said to be the legendary founder of Freemasonry, a myth concealing its true founder Francis Bacon, Viscount St Albans, was the ancient seat of Cassiboulin, uncle to King Cymbeline, which prompted the title and subject matter of the play. It was the modern French scholar Paul Arnold in an important work unfamiliar to the English reader that set forth at Paris in 1955, who was the first to reveal some of the other Rosicrucian subterranean layers hidden below the surface in his revelatory chapter entitled The Tragedy of Cymbeline and the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. The one French-speaking English scholar familiar with the work by French Rosicrucian historian Paul Arnold was Dr Frances A. Yates, who refers to it in her own groundbreaking Shakespeare's Last Plays, A New Approach. Speaking of the central mystery of the cave in Cymbeline, Dr Yates writes, 
there is some further hidden or esoteric meaning in the cave which makes one wonder whether rosicrucian symbolism or something like it might already have been current before the actual publication of the rosicrucian manifestos the central symbol of the fama is the vault or cave in which something long lost is found the tomb of christian rosencruz which was accidentally discovered in a vault according to the fiction recounted in the fama and the opening of which was the signal for the revival of the rosicrucian order the reviving chivalrous magic of cymbeline leads in due course to a vast religious peace an outpouring of new religious revelation in which all discord is harmonized in relation to paul arnold's work dr yates observes a French writer who has made a study of the Rosicrucian literature in relation to Shakespeare thinks that the chemical wedding reflects rituals of initi initiation through an action of the mystery of death. He believes that some of Shakespeare's plays, he mentions particularly Imogen's Deathlike Sleep and Resurrection in Cymbeline, reflect such experiences conveyed through esoteric allusion in the imagery. He sees influences of spiritual alchemy in the imagery of Cymbeline. The Rosicrucian method of using the play or the fiction as the vehicle through which to indicate esoteric meaning would also be Shakespeare's method. The first recorded performance of the most of overtly of all the Rosicrucian plays, The Tempest, took place on the 1st of November 1611 at the court of James I. It opens with a dramatic enactment of the tempest faced by the sea venture, which occurred off the coast of Bermuda as the British colonists headed to Virginia, the location of the first permanent English settlement in North America. A dramatic, symbolic portrayal representing the birth of what became the United States of America. This special play occupies a unique place in Shakespearean dramatic literature and for that reason is deliberately printed as the first play in the Shakespeare First Folio. Its central godlike figure, the scientific philosopher Prospero, is a complex dramatic portrait made in the image of his creator, the scientific philosopher Francis Bacon, founding father of modern science and the modern world. Through his all-knowing and all-seeing mind, the scientific philosopher Prospero Bacon controls the destiny of humankind and can be seen as the commander-in-chief of the Rosicrucian brothers who govern the invisible Solomon's house in his new Atlantis or land of the Rosicrucians, with Solomon's house or Solomon's temple, the central legend of its outer body, the speculative Freemasonry Brotherhood. Bacon had indicated in his private notebook he was to send some of his Rosicrucian emissaries to Italy and Germany, where he had contacts with printers and publishers who were in the forthcoming years about to publish a series of Rosicrucian publications. The first of these of interest to us appeared at Venice in 1612, a work entitled Di Raguali di Parnasso, put forward in the name of Trajano Boccolini, who died the following year in 1613. In a very curious work running to nearly 500 pages appears the 77th advertisement, a universal reformation of the whole wide world, by order of the god Apollo, is published by the seven sages of Greece and some other literati, in which Apollo attempts to initiate a universal reformation of the world. There are several 17th century tracts in which Bacon is compared or equated with the god Apollo, the Greek god of truth and prophecy. Three years after the publication of the Shakespeare First Folio, his own private secretary and Rosicrucian brother, Dr. William Rawley, issued the, the Memori Verses, containing 32 Latin elegies, wherein 11 of the versifiers held Bacon up as Apollo, leader of the Nine Muses. Herein he is called another Apollo, described as greater than Apollo, and where it is said that Apollo was fearful Bacon would replace him as a king of the muses. In 
In the final elegy, his friend, the poet and dramatist Thomas Randolph, one of Ben Jonson's sons, equates Bacon with Quirinus, revealing and confirming for those with eyes to see that Bacon is Shakespeare. When he perceived that the arts were held by no roots, and like seeds scattered on the surface of the soil were withering away, he taught the Pegasian arts to grow, as grew the spear of Quirinus, spear, spearman, i.e. Shakespeare swiftly into a laurel tree. Therefore, since he had taught the Heliconian goddesses to flourish, no lapse of ages shall dim his glory. The ardour of his noble heart could bear no longer than you, divine Minerva, Pallas Athena, the shaker of the spear, who wore a hel helmet which rendered her invisible, should be despised. His godlike pen restored your wonted honour, and as another Apollo, leader of the nine muses presiding over the different kinds of poetry and liberal arts dispelled the clouds that hid you The second anonymous Rosicrucian manifesto appeared in Latin at Castle in 1615, written across 14 chapters. The secret anonymous authorship of the two Rosicrucian manifestos, the Famo and Confessio, were cryptically revealed by Dr John Wilkins, the Warden of Wadham College, Oxford, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and afterwards First Secretary of the Rosicrucian Royal Society, in his work entitled Mathematical Magic. While discussing subterranean lamps, the Baconian dis disciple and Rosicrucian brother, Dr Wilkins, makes the following remarkable statement. Such a lamp is likewise related to be seen in the sep sepulchre of Francis Rosy Cross, as is more largely expressed in the confession of that fraternity. The lamp is referred to in the Fama, not the Confessio, an artful Rosicrucian device employed by Dr Wilkins to draw attention to a passage in which the Christian name of Bacon, Francis, is directly aligned with the Brotherhood of the Rose Cross, Rosy Cross, in relation to its two manifestos, at once indicating two profound secrets. Francis Bacon was the founding father of the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross and the concealed author of its two manifestos, The Fame and the Confession. A few years after the Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic Royal Society was formed in the second half of the 17th century, with Dr Wilkins appointed its first secretary, its official historian Thomas Spratt published the history of the Royal Society with a very important frontispiece. At its centre it depicts a bust of King Charles II with William Branca, its first president to his right, and on his left Francis Bacon, the founding father of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood. Its prime mover, Lord Bacon, is sitting under the prominent winged angel, holding a trumpet, which alludes to his first Rosicrucian manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis, that ends with Subumbra Alarum Tuarum Jehovah under the shadow of Jehovah's wings. The second Rosicrucian manifesto, the Confessio, contains a piece of devastating information not mentioned by Stratfordian authorities, orthodox Shakespeare biographers, editors or commentators. Its secret anonymous author, Bacon, points out how easily the so-called learned or learned fools and the rest of the credulous world are easily deceived with enigmas and illusions, one of them being of his own creation, which has misled and beguiled the sleepy universities and academia around the globe for centuries. Our age doth produce many such, 
one of the greatest being a stage player, a man with sufficient ingenuity for imposition. Seven years later, Lord Bacon published the Shakespeare First Folio, the greatest Rosicrucian Freemasonic work in the history of the world, behind the pseudonym of his semi-illiterate mask, William Shakespeare of Stratford, a Rosicrucian ludibrium that still deceives and fools the ordinary schoolman, academia and virtually the rest of the world to the present day.